Good morning. Welcome to the second lecture in the series Cosmology and the Origin of Structure. Yesterday morning, I talked about some cosmological parameters and gave some numbers for the present age of the universe, the expansion of the universe, and the uh, cosmic food chain, the contributions to the present energy density in terms of various components, matter, radiation, dark energy, etc. The subject I would like to speak about today is the growth of cosmological structures. And in this second lecture, I will talk about how small perturbations in the early universe can grow to become the structure that we see, the galaxies, clusters of galaxies, large-scale structures, stars, planets, people, poodles, pigeons, pond scum, everything that we see in the universe. And uh, this, uh, this study of the growth of structure in the universe is naturally divided into two regimes, the linear regime and the nonlinear regime. And in just about everything in physics, in the linear regime, you can write down equations and solve things, and you can do a quantitative analysis. And uh, some of the subjects I will discuss in this quantitative analysis is to introduce a genes analysis for inst gravitational instability, then apply this in, a, in an expanding universe for sub-Hubble radius size perturbations, where a Newtonian treatment suffices. Then I will introduce some concepts that are necessary for a full relativistic treatment of the problem that's necessary for perturbations that have a distance scale larger than the Hubble radius at any time. Then I will motivate a particular simple and attractive spectrum for the perturbations known as the harrison zeldovic spectrum. Then discuss dissipative processes that change the spectrum, the transfer function, and talk about linear evolution and how we can understand the power spectrum that we see of large-scale structure and its agreement with data. Now, in the nonlinear regime, once the perturbations become nonlinear, there's not much quantitatively that I can do. And uh, it's something that we refer to in Chicago as word calculus. You know, a lot of hand waving and you say a lot of words without really seeing very many equations. And it's, it's uh, you see pictures and say words. And I'll make some comparison to observations and discuss the fact that in addition to the great success that we have, in trying to understand the origin of structure, there are a few things that don't fit. It would be surprising if, in fact, everything fits. Okay, so why do we think that the growth of small perturbations is an important thing to understand for the origin of structure? So today, on a Tuesday, about 12 giga years after the bang, as we look out in the universe today, the radiation in the universe, in the three degree background radiation, is decoupled from the matter. We are not in thermal equilibrium with the universe, otherwise we would be at 3K and we'd be very uncomfortable. We would really need global warming then. So today the radiation in matter is decoupled. As we look out in the universe, we see temperature fluctuations of order 10 to the minus 5, 10 parts per million. But we see, at least on small scale, large density perturbations. A typical density of a galaxy is about a million times the average density of the universe. Each person sitting here has a density that's 10 to the 24 times larger than the average density of the universe, something to be proud of. So there are large perturbations in the mass density, but small perturbations in the temperature. Although today the matter and radiation is decoupled earlier in the history of the universe, say for the first 300 kilo years, 300,000 years after the bang, the radiation and matter were coupled. So as we look out and study the universe 300,000 years after the bang by probing the microwave background radiation, we're probing uh, the history of the universe when the radiation and matter were tightly coupled. And the fact that there are temperature perturbations of order 10 to the minus 5 tells us that density perturbations at the time of last scattering, at the time of recombination of the electrons and nuclei, should have been 10 to the minus 5. 
So 300,000 years after the bang, there were small perturbations. Today, the perturbations are large. So the idea that the growth that we see in the universe comes from gravitational instability of small perturbations. And we can understand this, this is part of the word calculus, in the following picture, that if we start, this is something that was known to the, at the time of Newton, that if we start with an arrangement of matter that's relatively uniform, but not perfectly uniform, then over time, regions that have a slightly larger density will attract surrounding matter, and the density perturbations will grow in time. Structure grows from something that's smooth. Regions that have a slightly larger density attract surrounding matter and grow at the expense of regions that have less density. So the way to remember this is to remember that gravity is the ultimate capitalistic force. The rich grow at the expense of the poor. And there's no end to it. This, of course, is based upon a simulation and much of what we know from large-scale structure comes from simulations. And I just thought I would remind you what exactly a simulation is. If you look in the o Oxford English Dictionary, a simulation is the action of practice of simulating with intent to deceive, a false pretense and a deceitful profession. I know no one here does simulations for a living. Now, the quantitative thing that we would like to understand to describe the structure, a statistic, the simplest statistic that we can develop, is the power spectrum. And this was introduced yesterday. And let me remind you that if we're going to assume that there is a meaningful average density to the universe that we can define. This is a non-trivial statement or assumption. For instance, if the distribution of matter in the universe was like a fractal, then there would be no average density that one could define. So we're assuming that the distribution is not like a fractal, that the power law, that the power spectrum is not a pure power law, and there is an average density we can define. The correct arena for playing around with the statistics is in Fourier space, and we can expand the density contrast the density field at any point in space, the difference between that and the average density, normalized by the average density, in terms of Fourier modes. And the autocorrelation function defines, it leads to the power spectrum. So after a little Fourier analysis, the autocorrelation function is the integral over the Fourier modes of k cubed times delta of k squared, and this is the power spectrum the power spectrum, sometimes called delta of k squared. This is the simplest statistic that one can um, develop to compare observations to theory. Now, in the linear regime, if you start with a certain power spectrum, a certain density perturbation, in the linear regime, each Fourier mode is going to evolve independently. So we will end up writing equations for the evolution of the individual Fourier modes. And of course, this is only valid in the linear regime. If the perturbations are nonlinear, then there's mode-mode mixing and things are more complicated. So let's start with a simple analysis of gra the simplest possible analysis of gravitational instability that was done by this gentleman, this proper British gentleman, Jimmy Jeans. Sir James Jeans. And this is the analysis of gravitational instability in a non-expanding fluid. So this does not directly apply to the expansion of the universe, but there are certain concepts that will be developed that will prove to be very useful. So let's imagine that there is a fluid in the universe that's not expanding, described by an energy density, a pressure, a velocity field, and a gravitational potential. And in general, these, of course, have a homogeneous solution where things are constant and we're interested in the perturbations about the homogeneous solution. So the energy density, pressure, velocity, and gravitational field um, obey the Euler equation, essentially the force equation, the continuity equation, 
and the Poisson equation for the gravitational potential. And we're going to perturb about a solution where the energy density is constant, the pressure is constant, the velocity is zero, and the gravitational field is constant. Now, there is a little bit of a strange thing about this solution we're perturbing about. If you look at it carefully, you will see something that's known as the gene swindle. This is not a solution to the equations. For instance, phi equal to a constant, grad squared phi is equal to zero, but rho is equal to a constant. So it's not really a solution to the equation, but don't worry about it. Everything's going to work out in the long run. Okay? So there's a little swindle going on now. So to be completely honest, well, I won't be completely honest. To be slightly honest, I'll warn you about the swindle. So combining these equations, what you end up with, if you were interested in the density perturbation, rho sub 1, the perturbed density, is an equation that looks like a wave equation for the evolution in time of the density, of the density perturbation. And here we've introduced the sound speed, the square of the sound speed is just in this limit, the pressure divided by the mass energy density. So if the matter is extremely cold, then the velocity is very small. So there is an equation that's satisfied by the perturbations. So this is the equation, and obviously this has solutions of the form e to the minus i k dot r plus i omega t. This is a solution provided omega and k satisfy the uh, dispersion relation that depends upon the wave number k, the sound speed, and the average density, the background density rho sub zero. And the character of the solution, whether it's an oscillating sound wave or an exponentially growing or decaying mode, depends upon whether omega is real or imaginary. If omega is real, then the perturbations are just going to oscillate like a sound wave, whereas if omega is imaginary, then the perturbations can be exponentially, can have exponential growth or exponential damping. The criterion whether the perturbations grow or not depends upon whether the wave number satisfies the genes criteria. If the wave number is larger than the gene's wave number, then, which is just 4 pi g rho zero of vs squared, then omega squared is positive, and we just have sound oscillations. If the wave number is smaller than the gene's wave number, then the perturbations grow. And instead of the wave number, we can talk about the gene's mass, which is the mass contained within some volume of 1 over the gene's wave number cubed, and if the mass is smaller than the gene's mass, then that size perturbation is, in some sense, stable. If you perturb on that length scale, it's just going to oscillate around without the perturbation growing or decaying. But if the mass, excuse me, this should be larger. If the mass is larger than the gene's mass, then the perturbation grows. So this is the interplay between the gravitational pressure, which wants things to collapse, and the thermal pressure, which prevents the collapse. A large enough mass, if you perturb a large enough mass, the gravitational pr pressure will win, and that wave number will collapse. So this is the genes analysis introducing the idea of a gravitational instability on certain scales, certain scales will be gravitationally unstable, certain scales won't, and the instability grows exponentially. The density field as a function of time, if omega is imaginary, will grow exponentially. So this is the usual genes analysis in a non-expanding universe. The analysis in the expanding universe, just a Newtonian analysis, was essentially done by Lifshitz in 1946. And what he did was a genes analysis in, in an expanding fluid. 
that's relevant for the expanding universe. And there's a scale factor A that describes the expansion. So there is an unperturbed solution where the energy density just decreases as A cubed, like you would expect the matter, energy, the matter density to decrease. The velocity uh, is taken to increase, like the, it's like Hubble's law, where the velocity is A dot over A times the distance. And uh, the equation for the uh, density field, the gravitational potential. Now, this solution at a distance scale of 1 over, at the Hubble radius, h to the minus 1, the velocity would be larger than 1. The velocity would be larger than c. So this, is only, this analysis is only valid, this is one of the reasons, this analysis will only be valid on distance scales that's smaller than the Hubble radius. The Hubble radius is h to the minus 1. It's the distance over which you can have causal interactions in a Hubble time. So if you want to talk about causal interactions causing things to collapse or expand or oscillate, then you have to discuss, you, you have to be limited to distance scales smaller than the Hubble radius. Well, if you go through about a page of algebra, you find an equation, second order differential equation, that describes the evolution of the K of delta, delta sub K, the wave number, the perturbation associated with wave number K. And it looks like the genes result except for the expansion term 2A dot over A times delta K dot. So the solution to this equation is some sort of Bessel function. I could show you graphs of Bessel functions, but that's not very important. Whether the solution describes an oscillation or an exponential growth, excuse me, or a growth, depends upon the genes criterion. So in the expanding universe, whether there's growth or not in the density field, in the perturbation, again, depends upon the genes criterion. In the matter-dominated era, for wave numbers less than the genes wave number, in other words, for masses larger than the genes mass, the, there's a growing mode and a decaying mode, and the growing mode grows as the temperature to the two-thirds power. So the difference in considering, in a matter-dominated universe, in considering an expanding fluid and doing gravitational instability is that rather than an exponential growth in the perturbation, there's a power growth, a power law growth in the perturbation. So as a perturbation wants to grow, the universe is expanding, and the interplay between the expansion and the gravitational instability converts an exponential instability into a power law instability. This is true in a matter-dominated era, if we look at perturbations in the density field in a radiation-dominated era, they do not grow. So in a radiation-dominated era, the density perturbations, the matter density perturbations, do not grow. In a matter-dominated era, it grows as the temperature to the two-thirds. So we're looking at sort of at different levels of complexity. The first thing we studied was the genes instability in a non-expanding fluid. Now we, I touched upon the genes instability, the gravitational growth, gravitational instability in an expanding universe, but on distance scales smaller than the Hubble radius. To do the analysis on, for distance scales larger than the Hubble radius, super Hubble radius size perturbations, you really have to employ general relativity. And the way this is done is to start with the metric, that's the Robertson-Walker metric, and you have perturbations in the metric. The Robertson-Walker metric is only a function of time, and the perturbations will be functions of space and time. In addition to the metric perturbations, you have perturbations in the stress-energy tensor T mu nu, and what you want to do is to solve the perturbed Einstein equations. You'll be happy to know that I won't do this for you. The complete analysis is not for the faint of heart, right? It's a, it's a, 
becomes grungy. Let me make some comments and then I'll expand upon them. There are many types of, there are three types of perturbations of the metric, tensor, scalar, and vector. We are interested, and I'll explain these in a minute, in the scalar perturbations, the things that we identify as perturbations in the density field. The perturbations end up solving, uh, excuse me, uh, satisfying uh, essentially a fourth order differential equation. In the genes analysis, it was a second order differential equation. There was a growing mode and a decaying mode, essentially. Now we're going to have a fourth order differential equation, so there will be four solutions. In general, only two of them will be physical. The other two will be gauge artifacts, solution, things that look like perturbations, but they can be removed by a coordinate redefinition. These are called gauge modes. <clears throat> okay, so let me, I'm going to use mostly word calculus here and not go to, through too much detail. So we want to solve the perturbed Einstein equations, and what do we want to perturb about? We want to perturb about a flat Rob Friedman Robertson Walker metric, an unperturbed, homogeneous, isotropic, flat universe. And the metric for this is, is most conveniently written by introducing something called conformal time. Now, conformal time is not a mystery. You, you know, I'm sure here in Geneva you can buy a watch that keeps conformal time. I'm sure they have. They're probably very expensive. Uh, conformal time is just a measure of time that changes with the expansion of the universe. So it's warped a bit. So if you write the usual metric, you can, in terms of time t, if you define some conformal time, eta, which changes as the expansion rate changes, then the metric can be written in terms of this scale factor times something that looks like a, it's conformally equivalent to Minkowski space. So conformal space, in conformal time, things are just a lot simpler. So we want to solve the perturbed Einstein's equation, and we have the reference space-time, and then we have a perturbed space-time, where the, ins the metric, instead of being 1, as in the background, is going to be 1 plus delta G00. Zero zero. In the background, there was no dt dx term. Now there's going to be dg0i, d eta dxi. This is the perturbed part. And whereas this essentially is one, now there's going to be a perturbed part to the spatial part of the metric. So the perturbed metric delta g mu nu is a symmetric four by four uh, matrix, so it has 10 degrees of freedom. So in the delta g's, there are 10 degrees of freedom. And these 10 degrees of freedom can be described in terms of how they transform on the spatial hypersurfaces. So the unperturbed metric, the flat Robertson-Walker metric, uh, it just evolves in conformal time, and the spatial sections remain flat. The perturbed metric, however, the spatial sections in general are curved, and as conformal time goes on, the curvature changes. And when we say it's perturbations, what we're doing is, is looking at the difference between the metric here and the metric here, the metric there, the metric at this conformal time, etc. And you can decompose the metric tensor perturbations into various, in various ways, it's like the equivalent of, it's more complicated, but it's the equivalent of decomposing a vector field in terms of a gradient and a curl, right? So delta G00 transforms like a scalar on the different spatial hypersurfaces. Delta G0i transforms like a vector but you can write this in terms of the gradient of a scalar 
in a vector that has uh, the derivative zero. And you can count up the number of degrees of freedom in this various. I think I've done it correctly. You know, there are, in general, there are three types of cosmologists, those who can count and those who can't count. Now, this is uh, about the limit of my counting ability. You know, I can count to 10, so I can do it without using a calculator, just with my finger. So I think I, I correctly accounted here for all the degrees of freedom. So delta G i j can be decomposed into various scalar, vector, and tensor degrees of freedom. Now, the reason this is a useful thing to do is because in linear theory, the evolution of scalar, vector, and tensor perturbations decouple. Remember, there are 10 degrees of freedom you're screwing around with, so if you can find, write the equations in, in such a way that the evolution decouples, you're much better off. So there are vector perturbations which are not sourced by the stress tensor, and they decay rapidly in expansion. So we will not be interested in vector perturbations. There are tensor perturbations, which also do not couple to the stress tensor. And these appear essentially as a background of gravitational waves. What we are interested in in talking about density perturbations are the scalar perturbations, which do couple to perturbations in the stress tensor. And these are the things that you would naively, not naively, you would physically call ten, uh, density perturbations, so it's the scalar perturbations. <clears throat> and whether there are also, uh, in general, there are four solutions to the scalar perturbations, but two of them can be removed by gauge transformations, so it's very important to know whether the solution you found is a gauge artifact or if it's a physical, something physical describing the evolution of a density. So in various gauges, what I've skipped about 30 pages of algebra, uh, what you end up with is solving for a matter-dominated or radiation-dominated universe how the growing mode changes with time. And the growing mode changes as t to the two-thirds in a matter-dominated universe and linear with time in a radiation-dominated universe. So this can be combined with the analysis that we did for scales smaller than the Hubble radius. In the matter-dominated era, Perturbations grow as the time to the two-thirds on scales larger and smaller than the Hubble radius. In the radiation-dominated era, scales larger than the Hubble radius grow with time, but scales smaller than the Hubble radius do not grow. They are constant. And that's all I'll have to say about the growth of perturbations in the early universe. Now, let's try to imagine what kind of spectrum the perturbations can have. And the natural spectrum to consider is a spectrum known as the harrison zeldovich spectrum. In, uh, remember, in the radiation-dominated era, scales smaller than the Hubble radius there is no growth in the perturbation, and on scales larger than the Hubble radius, it grows with time. And in the matter-dominated era, on both sub-Hubble radius and super-Hubble radius, perturbations grow as the time to the two-thirds. So let's imagine we're in the radiation-dominated era, and we're looking at the log of the density perturbation and the log of the wave number, or the momentum there is a certain wave number that corresponds to the Hubble radius, a wave number of 1 over the Hubble radius. So very large momentum, large wave number, are smaller than the Hubble radius, small wave number on the uh, infrared that's larger than the Hubble radius. Now let's imagine that the power spectrum has some power law form of k to the n. 
remember in the linear regime, each Fourier mode evolves independently. So this growth is true for each K. Then, if we look at some later time, the Hubble radius is, the physical size of the Hubble radius is going to be larger, the momentum is going to be smaller, and this will also have the same power law because each mode grows with the same rate, but the amplitude of the spectrum is going to increase as in the radiation dominated era proportional to time. So this spectrum increases on scales larger than the Hubble radius. Uh, I'm sorry, that is Zeldovich. A picture of him that I took at Fermilab that was published in Dennis Overby's book without my permission, but that's the way it goes. Uh, the harrison zodovich spectrum. So if the power law here is k to the 1, then the growth on super Hubble radius sizes is such that every time a particular scale crosses the Hubble radius, delta squared k cubed times p of k is equal to a constant. So in the radiation dominated era, if we look at all scales smaller than the Hubble radius, the perturbations are going to have the same amplitude for all wave number on all scales. Now let's imagine, for instance, that the power, that the power spectrum was k to the n, where n was larger than 1. So this is steeper than this. Then scales down here will not grow as much, start much smaller. So by the time they enter the horizon, the Hubble radius, they're going to have a smaller scale, a smaller amplitude. So on scales sub-Hubble radius, the spectrum will be, have an ultraviolet catastrophe where on small scales, eventually you would become nonlinear. If the power law is k to the n, where n is smaller than 1, then it's an infrared catastrophe that the large scales, large k, has small wave number, but small k in the infrared will have a larger perturbation. So k equal to 1 is a spectrum here that's adjusted in such a way that as every scale enters the Hubble radius and stops growing, the physical perturbation on that size, described by delta squared, is going to have the same amplitude. So the only consistent spectrum one can imagine for the primordial perturbations, if it follows a power law without some cutoff, is a number n that's close to 1. 0.8, 1.2. It cannot be very blue or it cannot be very red. So the Harrison Zeldovich spectrum is a natural spectrum. So the Harrison Zeldovich spectrum, I showed this for P sub K. Um, if I would show this, I'm sorry, this, should, uh, this is for delta the actual delta squared here. If I would show it for the power spectrum, then on scales that are super Hubble radius, it increases as k to the 1. And on scales smaller than the Hubble radius, p of k decreases as k to the minus 3, because k cubed times p of k is equal to a constant. So in the radiation dominated era, this is what the power spectrum looks like. It increases as k until you reach a scale associated with the Hubble radius, and then it decreases as k to the minus 3. This is the, this is the harrison zeldovich spectrum. In the radiation-dominated era, there's no growth on scales that are smaller than the Hubble radius. Then the universe becomes matter-dominated and the power spectrum grows as t to the two-thirds on all scales. 
So once the universe becomes matter dominated, it's going to grow the, with the same rate on all scales. So this shape will remain the same, but the amplitude will increase with time. And this, in fact, we believe, is the power spectrum that we're observing today. So when we observe the power spectrum today, this, again, is the harrison zeldovich spectrum, starting as k to the 1, and then decreasing as k to the minus 3. And exactly where it makes this transition depends upon when matter radiation equality occurred which depends upon the product of omega matter times h. But the form is the same. It goes as k to the 1 for small wave number and k to the minus 3 for large wave number. These wave numbers down here were larger than the Hubble radius when the universe became matter dominated. And these wave numbers on this side were smaller than the Hubble radius when the universe became matter dominated. So this shape, which is imprinted on the density field of the universe today, is the result of the interplay of the growth of perturbations in the early universe. So this is a way to understand why the power spectrum emerges this way if you start with the harrison zeldovich spectrum. Now, so far, I have assumed that the universe, essentially, the fluid in the universe is a perfect fluid. And there's no dissipation of anything in the universe. But in fact, that's not true. There are dissipative processes. And the two that I will talk about, one would apply to massive neutrinos, and the other applies to baryons. So let's see what happens to massive neutrinos. Neutrinos are non-interacting. Their mean free path is very large. And if they have a mass of a few EV or so, then they are relativistic for much of the history of the universe. And they would suffer something known as collisionless phase mixing or free streaming. If, if it's not a perfect fluid. The neutrinos have a very large mean free path, so I get a lot of neutrinos, a density field of neutrinos, and I put them here. If they're very fast and relativistic, they're just going to stream out, free stream, land out damp, just stream out of any density inhomogeneities. So if the dark matter is relativistic or semi-relativistic, then the if it's hot, like neutrinos, then the particles can stream out of overdense region and smooth out in homogeneities. The faster the particle is, the longer its free streaming length. So at a given temperature, if the neutrino has a smaller mass, it's going to have a larger free streaming length. So the example of this is EV range neutrinos. So this is the result of the power spectrum if you include the effect of free streaming of neutrinos. So this, was, this is the CDM power spectrum in green. Cold dark matter does not free stream. It's cold. It has no velocity. So it does not stream out of overdense regions. If we look at a model that's in hot dark matter model, say a, a neutrino of 30 electron volts or so, then there's a certain scale at which it streams out the free streaming. On this scale, it, these scales are too large for the neutrinos to have free stream that distance. But here, on smaller length scales, the neutrinos are damp and free because of free streaming. And this also shows a model that you have 70% cold dark matter and 30% hot dark matter. So the power spectrum will change depending upon the matter content, whether you have massive neutrinos in the mix or not. 
and the effect is more noticeable on large momentum scales or small length scales. Another dissipative process is collisional damping that's suffered by the baryons. This is also known as silk damping. As the around recombination, as the baryons decouple from the photons, the photon mean free path becomes very large. As the photons escape from dense regions, they can drag baryons along, erasing baryon perturbations on small scales. And in fact, the baryon photon fluid is going to suffer damped oscillations. Let's, let's compare, a, uh, this in fact is essentially a CDM model, I just sort of chose these at random, that has a little bit of baryons, but mostly cold dark matter. So this is mostly the usual cold dark matter power spectrum. This is a model that has very little cold dark matter, and it's a model that has only baryons. And you see what happens on this scale, the baryons are damped because of collisional damping, and here you see the oscillations. So if there is no dark matter in the universe, no cold dark matter, if the only thing in the universe is baryons, then what you would expect for the power spectrum is something that's damped here, which does not agree with the observations that fit the cold dark matter. This is another argument for the existence of cold dark matter. There seems to be no way to produce the perturbations on this scale that correspond to galaxies and clusters if the universe has only baryons and curvature perturbations that uh, is a usual picture. Now let's turn to the linear evolution of the power spectrum. And here I've shown today a power spectrum that fits the data. It has the product gamma equal to omega times h of 0 0.2, 0 0.25, I don't remember what I used. So this is the evolution today. If the evolution is linear, then the amplitude of the power spectrum evolves the same way on all momentum modes. The evolution of the different momentum modes are decoupled in the linear regime. So if it's only linear ev evolution, if this is what's observed today, then I can predict what the power spectrum was like at larger redshift. So around the time of recombination, when the microwave background decoupled, the power spectrum was small, and then it evolved. In order to understand the physics of what's going on, rather than looking at P of K, I think it's better to look at delta squared of K, which is the perturbation amplitude, the power per logarithmic interval in K. So if you look at k cubed p of k, I think you get a better picture of what's going on. This is k cubed p of k today. And again, if it's linear evolution, it just changes as time to the 2 3rd or just proportional to the scale factor in a matter-dominated universe. So around here, around 8 h to the minus 1 megaparsec is the nonlinear regime. So perturbations up here are nonlinear. Perturbations down here are still in the linear regime. At redshift equal to 10, the average perturbation was in the linear regime. At redshift equal to 1,000, everything was in the linear regime. So the picture that you have in the linear regime, looking back at redshift of 1,000, everything is linear. Each mode evolves independently. At redshift equal to 100, things are mostly in the linear regime. Once you get around redshift equal to 10, you start having Gaussian perturbations, rare regions that have 
amplitude larger than one, and you start to have nonlinear evolution. So you can track the linear evolution down to redshift, say, between 10 and 100, then the evolution becomes nonlinear, and you can no longer use the decoupled equations to say how growth will occur. So life ain't linear. Around or between a redshift of 110, this is the word calculus part of the lecture, many scales are becoming nonlinear at about the same time. Looking at the spectrum, you see that here there's not much difference. Smaller length scales have a little bit larger amplitude, but it's not much difference. So many scales are becoming nonlinear at about the same time. In addition to the growth of individual modes, you're going to have mergers from smaller objects while larger objects are being formed. What you have to do is to do an n-body simulation, which you can do for dissipationless dark matter. Baryons will collapse in these lumps along with the dark matter, but baryons undergo processes that dissipate their energy and they can form a tighter structure. And to calculate that properly requires, in addition to the n-body simulation for the dark matter, hydro calculations for the baryons. Going through this numerical simulation, remember the definition of simulation, you can compare this to observations and this power spectrum is well fit if omega times h, this product is 0 0.2, 0 0.25, or something like that. However, there's more to life than the power spectrum. The power spectrum does not give the complete picture of large-scale structure if there are non-Gaussian perturbations. For instance, if we look at th this density field where it's a filamentary structure in the universe, and take the power spectrum of this and look at this density field and take the power spectrum of this, these two have exactly the same power spectrum. But you don't have to be a very careful observer to notice that the density fields do not look the same here. Here there are correlations in the phases of the, dense, of the different Fourier modes. The power spectrum only describes the density field if, the, if there is no correlation in the phases and there are, and, and the perturbations are Gaussian. In general, in addition to the power spectrum, the two-point correlation function, you have to specify the three-point, the four-point, the five-point usual uh, hierarchy that you have to do. So in addition to the power spectrum, there's the skewness, the kurtosis, the psoriasis, I don't remember what, what the rest of the things are. Okay, so there's more to life than the power spectrum. The large-scale structure, the picture of large-scale structure that emerges from the numerical simulation fits the data well, fits the observations of the universe very well. So this picture that I've described to you seems to describe the universe well on very large scales. Perhaps it does not describe the universe so well on small scales. And let me point out two problems that we don't yet understand about small scale structure. One is the individual velocities profile of galaxies or halos. So this is a picture of a very large scale. This is the filamentary structure that observes. Just taking the power spectrum is not adequate for describing this. This is an n-body simulation. This would be a supercluster of galaxies. You look in here and you can find individual galaxies and measure the halo structure, the rotational velocity of individual dark matter halos. And from a numerical simulation of CDM, cold dark matter halos, this is, this is what results. This is from a paper of Ben Moore. So this is what the numerical simulations suggest 
the dark matter halos should have a velocity profile as a function of distance from the center of the dark matter halo. But this doesn't exactly look like galaxies. These are the results of observed galaxies. So it looks to be a steeper rise, a cuspier nature to structure at small scales than what is observed. Now, this distance scale is, is, you know, 20 kiloparsec. And here you're doing simulations where the distance scale is 2,000 megaparsec. So the dynamical range of the distant, different simulations that are done are just enormous. So if this is a simulation that describes the universe, you're looking at the behavior of things that are really small. This doesn't seem to fit observations, and people don't know what to make of this. They don't know whether the simulation's wrong, or in fact the observations are incorrectly interpreted, or perhaps there's something, somehow the hydrodynamics of baryons on small scales plays a larger effect than people might imagine. This is one of the things that people do not understand. Another aspect of these results of the simulations that people don't understand is the fact that the simulations suggest in our galaxy there should be a lot of small satellite galaxies. Now, as we look around in our galaxy, we see dwarf galaxies associated with our galaxy, right? There are seven dwarfs, and we all know their names, Dopey, Sleepy, what have you. There are seven dwarf galaxies in, around our galaxy. The simulations suggest that there should be hundreds of dwarf galaxies, like the Magellanic Cloud, Fornax, Veltor, etc. And in fact, galaxies should look like a rescaled version of clusters of galaxies. This is the result of a simulation, a large-scale numerical simulation of a cluster of galaxies. Um, so this the mass contained in here is 5 times four, 10 to the 14 solar masses, a typical mass of a cluster of galaxies. And the distance scale here is about 2 megaparsec. So this suggests a cluster of galaxies has a central core and a lot of galaxies surrounding it. And this looks like a cluster of galaxies. If you wake up an astronomer sometime during the day and show them this picture and say, is this a cluster of galaxies? They might say yes, right? But it's the result of a numerical simulation. The same simulations done at higher resolution on a smaller scale, where this scale is only 300 kiloparsec, and the mass here is 2 times 10 to the 12 solar masses, say a galaxy should look like this, where there's a main galaxy, but there's a lot of substructure, a lot of satellite galaxies. This is not what our galaxy looks like, right? We see only seven or so dwarf galaxies around ours, and the numerical simulation suggests that there should be more. And you can quantify that result by calculating the cumulative number of halos as a function of the velocity. This is what the numerical simulation suggests for a cluster of galaxies and for a simulated galaxy. This is the data from the Virgo cluster of galaxies. So it just shows you the number of satellites for various mass and profile fit what's observed for clusters. This is our galaxy, and this is what the simulation suggests for our galaxies. Again, the, the clusters and galaxies should look alike, but it's not what our galaxy looks like. So what I've uh, hoped to have done in this lecture is to give you a quantitative picture of the growth of perturbations when the perturbations are linear. I talked about the genes analysis, that some perturbations grow due to gravitational instability and some do not. I talked about the Newtonian analysis for sub-Hubble radius size perturbations. I talked about the GR analysis for super Hubble radius perturbations, admittedly a bit sketchy. It's sort of a complicated, involved subject. 
I talked about a spectrum that seems to emerge from the noise and dust and what have you. That's a natural spectrum, the harrison zeldovich spectrum, and processes that would change the spectrum, the transfer function, and the linear evolution, and how this imprint, this is measured from the microwave background over here, the power spectrum. This is measured from large-scale structure. And the harrison zeldovich spectrum, to a good approximation, seems to describe the power spectrum that's observed. I talked a little bit about nonlinear revol evol revolution, nonlinear evolution, evolution in the nonlinear regime. The comparison to observations are very good on large scales, scales larger than galaxies. It's on, there are a few clouds on the horizon, the simulations on scales <clears throat> that are the size of galaxies or smaller do not seem to agree with observations. Although there's a lot of uncertainty on small scales, you need a tremendous dynamical range to study the small scales. Hydrodynamics may play a role. The observations may be incorrectly interpreted. The simulations may be deceitful, insidious. Or it could be that there's something having to do with dark matter on, that would play up on small scales. We don't know the answer to that. So tomorrow in Rocky Three, what I will do is to talk about inflation and the origin of perturbations. How an epoch in the early universe, an epoch of inflation, will produce a harrison zeldovich spectrum. So this harrison zeldovich spectrum that seems to be a natural spectrum and agree with observation is predicted by models of inflation. So I'll discuss how inflation predicts and uh, provides an arena for producing the perturbations. And finally, on Thursday, I'll talk about ideas for dark matter. What is the dark matter of the universe? And hopefully sometime before Thursday, I'll have an idea for dark energy. No one's had any good ideas yet, but I'll uh, think about it and maybe I'll come up with something for Thursday. Thank you.